Hi guys, and welcome back for another video. In this one, we're gonna be talking about a biggie that I cannot believe I haven't covered yet. Let's talk about die-off reactions, AKA Herxing reactions, and what you can do about them. Now, you know the way I roll. Before you know what to do about something, you have to understand what it is and some of the physiology behind it. So, behold this beautiful artwork. I know, I know, it's grand. So, what I'm gonna draw out for you is the mechanism of how a die-off reaction works, we think, and then we can talk about places in this schematic where we can intervene. So, as an example, we have the gut tube. Theoretically, this could be anywhere from your mouth all the way to your anus, because it's just one big hollow connected tube. For those of you with SIBO, we're obviously thinking more of small intestine. For people with candida overgrowth or other types of dysbiosis, we're thinking more colon, if you have CIFO, we're thinking more small intestine. You know, it could be anywhere in the gut too, but for the purposes of my channel, we're probably talking about colon and small intestine for most of y'all. Next up, we've got the bloodstream. This is a nice squiggly blood vessel I've drawn. And this is important because that's how stuff, stuff gets carted around your body. And that's how your immune system largely gets carted around your body. And then it's your immune system that makes inflammation. And that is inherently what we're talking about here. And then finally over here, we have all the cells of your entire body, give or take a few trillion cells. So here's what a die-off reaction is basically at its core. In the gut tube on any given day, you have about a gazillion, obviously very accurate number, you have about a gazillion bacteria, yeast, sometimes parasites, all different kinds of bacteria, food, you name it, you've got creepy crawlers in the gut tube. And that's okay, as long as they're confined to that gut tube and as long as they're not too squirrely of a mixture. But if you start to get dysbiosis, for example, we'll color some of these guys a little bit darker green. If you start to get an overgrowth of the wrong type of bacteria, so if you have a pathogenic strain of E. coli or C. diff, Shigella, uh, things of that nature. If you have something pathogenic, then that could be bad news. If you have an overgrowth of candida, that is going to be a fungal dysbiosis. Or in the case of SIBO, if we imagine that the top half of this is the small intestine, the bottom half is the colon, if you just have an overabundance of bacteria, period, up in the small bowel where they frankly don't belong, then that's gonna cause a whole heck of a lot of inflammation. And folks, what goes hand in hand with inflammation? Nine times out of 10 in the gut? leaky gut. So here's where stuff gets really squirrely is you have this massive, massive amount of creepy crawlers living in your gut at any given time. And as long as they're confined to the gut, that's usually okay. But if you start getting leaky gut, which I will depict, actually, I will just erase like so. That does the trick. Once you start getting leakiness or damage to the gut, that didn't erase as perfectly as I wanted to, but well, once you start getting damage to that gut lining and you have leaky gut, now we have the perfect opportunity for either bacteria or yeast or their particles or their toxins to get through the gut barrier. Boom. Now, in a lot of cases, this is going to be called endotoxemia. That's a little bit more specific than I'm comfortable with, but we'll still talk about it. Endotoxin is a type of toxin produced by gram-negative bacteria, which if you think about the bacteria that are typically known human pathogens that cause like food poisoning or post-infectious IBS, these guys are typically gram-negatives. So they're more inflammatory, more often than not, than the gram-positives, although there's certainly some exceptions like strep and uh, staphylococcus species. But endotoxin, aka LPS, is a type of toxin from gram-negative bacteria. Now there are things that gram-positive bacteria make that could be very inflammatory, and there's things that yeast and parasites can make that could be very pro-inflammatory. But loosely, if you want something to read and you wanna fall down like the PubMed rabbit hole, start looking up endotoxemia research because that's some of what we're talking about this mechanism right now. So anyway, you've got creepy crawlers hanging out in your gut. If you have a leaky gut, which if you have a profound amount of GI inflammation, candida, SIBO, something, if you're watching my channel, I can almost guarantee you have some amount of leaky gut. And stuff gets weird when it starts to get through the gut barrier. These endotoxins or these bacterial toxins or yeast toxins or fragments of their cell walls start to get through 
and then eventually could gain access to the bloodstream. And that's where, again, the immune system hangs out. There's also a heck of a lot of immune system cells that just hang out right underneath the gut lining. Again, this is kind of old news for most of you, but about 70% of your immune system hangs out right here along the gut tube. So they're ready for action. But even so, you get some stuff that gets through. It either has an immediate inflammatory response under the gut, or it gets into systemic circulation. And now some of the immune cells, say from a lymph node or a lymph vessel, comes cruising in here, comes into the blood vessel to check out the toxin, which I will label with a T. These toxins instigate an immune response, and then it's that immune response typically that is inherently inflammatory because your immune system, whether here or here, knows that these toxins and these fragments of bacteria and yeast and parasites are indicative that an enemy is afoot and you need to obliterate it. So it's then that that goes on. Let's see, I'm running out of colors. Hopefully none of you are colorblind. Then the immune system makes boatloads of inflammation, which I will just put with an I, I for inflammation. So this is about what happens with a dire reaction. Typically what'll happen is that somebody starts messing with the ecosystem in their gut, usually in a perfectly reasonable, good way, right? So you either start killing candida or you start on a SIBO protocol or an anti-parasite protocol or a cleanse or something of that nature. You start tinkering with the microbial community in your gut or in whatever tract you're talking about, vaginal tract, sinuses, whatever. And that changing of the architecture of the microbial community changes it enough that either you get a flare up of the toxins and the crap that they produce because bugs don't want to go quietly and they don't want to die and they get ticked. And then that gets through and causes this inflammatory cascade. Or if you are potentially killing things, you're lysing or breaking open cells. And then it's those bits and fragments, the debris from the killing of the bacteria or the yeast or the whatever. It's that lysis, it's that breaking open. And now you have little teeny tiny particles of the bacteria that was once alive or the yeast that was once alive. And now it's these little particles that can get through. Whether we're talking about the toxins or the particles themselves of the once living creature, this is enough to instigate a heck of an inflammatory response, especially in a susceptible person. So here's the way I go about kind of predicting this with my patients. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that not a lot of my patients get profound die off reactions because I've gotten pretty good at curtailing it. But for people who have higher inflammatory markers on blood work, for example, C-reactive protein, or if they have elevated ferritin, or like a wonky looking CBC, or their white blood cells are off kilter, um, those are the people for whom I will typically warn them about die off before it happens, because I think it's more likely that an inflamed person is going to have more of this inflammatory cascade. The other thing is I've noticed that certain formulas and herbs are more die-off-y than other ones. Um, one of my favorite combos that I'll do a video about one of these days is fc cidal and dysbiocide. I have not seen a die-off reaction from that combination yet, knock on wood. But lorisidin, I've seen die-off reactions quite a bit from. Now it could be because that's a really potent biofilm disruptor. It could be because of the yeast component, the viral component, the bacterial component, I don't know. But for whatever reason, lorisidin tends to be die-off-y, whereas something like fc cidal and dysbiocide really is not die-off-y for most people, even if you're susceptible. Anyhow, so here is now the whole reason why you're watching this video probably is that you don't necessarily give a shit how die-off happens. You want to know, all right, lady, look, I'm in the throes of a die-off reaction right now, or I'm, an, I'm nervous that I'm going to get one. How do I curtail it? How do I stop it so it doesn't keep running away from me? And here's the thing. With die-off reactions being inherently inflammatory, you do need to curtail them. You don't want to just tough it out. I admire people who are just like, it's okay, doc. I can feel, I can feel crappy for a week if it means I'm going to get rid of my yeast. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's great that you have that, you know, that gumption, but also I don't want to flame you out and jeopardize healing and progress because you're trying to tough it out. So here are the main areas where I think we have a window of opportunity. And here I'm going to switch to black now. All right, so here's your biggest windows of opportunity as far as die-off reactions. There's 
two to talk about the gut right off the get-go because we can talk about root causes first and then work our way out. Number one is obviously just modifying the ecosystem of the bacteria. So that would be things like antifungals, changing up your antimicrobial herbs, backing down on the dose. I have people start off on lorisidin very, 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 very slowly. Um, like sometimes I have people start with just those two little flakes or the two little pellets three times a day and then I have them double the dose every day. If you start with a full scoop of lorisidin, you're gonna be hurting usually. So that's one thing is you can just modify your dose. You could back down to the dose that you were able to tolerate previously. And that oftentimes will be helpful. So you can change herbs. Obviously, if you're doing drugs, if you're doing like Zyfaxin or Neomycin, talk to your prescriber before you go mucking up the doses of your drugs because that is a whole different ball game. You could induce tolerance or antibiotic resistance. Generally with drugs, you wanna keep that dose where it is unless your prescriber gives you permission to modify it. With herbs, I do usually give my, my patients permission to modify the dose if they need to. So you can change your herbs or your antimicrobials. Number two is you can take binders and I'll kind of draw this down here. All right, you could take a binder or something that will attract those toxins and those fragments of bacteria and yeast like glue. And that way you can just poop it out, no harm, no foul, and it doesn't get a chance to tick off your immune system. The most famous one that I know of for this is charcoal. Activated charcoal is dirt cheap. It's like 10 bucks for a bottle and it's very, very effective. So you could usually go out to any old whole paycheck, Sprouts Farmer's Market, heck, maybe even a normal grocery store would have activated charcoal, but it works really marvelously and it's cheap. The only thing to know is to take it away from food, but otherwise there's almost no ill consequence. Um, there are some fancier charcoals and there are things like clay and diatomaceous earth. And like, I don't typically recommend those. I think that they're unnecessary because clay, or I'm sorry, charcoal does a stupendous job all on its own. So I usually don't go for the fancier like proprietary blends like the GI detox and whatnot. I just have people do straight up charcoal. Uh, and there are fancier types of charcoal that are made with bamboo and more hypoallergenic sources. I don't usually see the need. I haven't had anybody react poorly to, to the charcoal yet in and of itself. So I think it's probably unnecessary for most people. Um, anyhow, so you could try to decrease the amount of bacterial or candida or parasitic burden of chemicals and crap coming up from your gut by either modifying the speed at which you are killing them off or binding up the stuff. So taking a few charcoals a couple times a day away from meals, those two usually are where I will start people off because it's more of a true root cause approach to this. Number three, I think is usually relevant is that the people who get die off, in my opinion, tend to have leaky gut and they tend to have a more profoundly leaky gut. Because again, the whole premise of this is basically endotoxemia you're getting crap that's coming up through the gut lining and it's getting out into the systemic circulation, it's getting out to where your immune system's hanging out and it's instigating an inflammatory response. So number three that you could do is just heal your dang gut. And I know I've had a couple videos on this and I will do more in the future, but some of my go-tos, for example, if I know somebody has a leaky gut, but I don't want to throw a lot of like FODMAPI herbs or a lot of, you know, wild cards like probiotics in quite yet. So some of the ones that are generally tolerated really, really well are zinc carnosine, glycine, and glutamine. You can get all three of those as single ingredient supplements. Two would be a powder, one would probably come as a capsule, and they work splendidly. And they're very hypoallergenic and they're tolerated by most people. Um, once I get through the initial kind of stuff with leaky gut, then I will typically get people onto like a formula for leaky gut and it'll be a little bit more intricate. But in the beginning, when I'm just trying not to tick off their immune system that much, those are my three starting points typically. All right, so if you heal the lining of the gut and close up these little holes, then the bacterial toxins should not be able to get through. Bada bing, bada boom, no more die off. Here's the third thing. I'm sorry, the fourth thing. So one is changing the herbs, two is binders, three is heal your dang leaky gut. Easier said than done sometimes. Number four, particularly if you are watching this video right now and you're like, 
I'm dying. Like I am in day two of a die off reaction. I'm miserable and I don't know what to do. And like, it's going to take me a couple of days to get the glutamine or get the binders or whatever. Here's what you can do. You can start backward. It's the opposite of the root cause. You're starting with the branches in the tree first, but it's okay because it does help. Let's see, I'm going to turn this way. Got to get used to this board. So the other thing that you could do, because remember we came over here, the toxins have gotten through and they've ticked off an immune response and it's your immune system that is churning up bucket loads of inflammation called cytokines. What you could do is you could try to inhibit inflammation directly. So being that, So you could try to inhibit inflammation and this you could largely do with food. If you think about anything, if you do a Google right now and Google anti-inflammatory foods or anti-inflammatory supplements or herbs or whatever, you will find a buttload of stuff. So I'm talking turmeric, resveratrol, green tea, boswellia, sulforaphane, which is in broccoli sprouts. You could get broccoli sprouts at whole paycheck usually. I mean, at least mine. Um, God, like you could do literally all of the culinary herbs in some way, shape or form have an anti-inflammatory action. Ginger is one of my absolute favorites. So even if you don't want to leave the house, you could probably whip yourself up like some turmeric, some ginger, maybe, I don't even know, just go pull all of the spices out of your cabinet, make yourself like a little slurry. Sometimes I'll have my patients just go get curry powder or turmeric out of their cupboard, mix it with coconut oil because it's going to emulsify it better in fat. And I just take a big old spoonful of the nasty coconut oil and turmeric mixture. And that actually does a pretty good job in and of itself when you're in a pinch, if you need a couple of days before your Amazon shipment comes in or whatever. So as a recap, if you're in the throes of a die-off reaction, here's what you could do. You have four windows of opportunity where you can intervene. Like I said, I tend to start with the root cause mentality first, then move my way forward. But because you could do a lot with food from point number four, I do have people work that in at some point too. But right out the get-go, you can modify the doses of your herbs or your supplements. You could drop down to what you had previously tolerated if you were titrating up to a higher dose. Uh, talk to your prescriber if you're gonna to try to do that with prescriptions though. I don't generally recommend that. You could take a binder like activated charcoal, which is my favorite and it's dirt cheap. You could try clay, you could try some of the fancy ones. I just don't think they're necessary. Uh, but binders work incredibly well. You can work toward healing your leaky gut, which again is going to be a little catch 22 y right now, but you can still work on that with things like zinc carnosine, L glutamine, and glycine, which are all very tolerated, very hypoallergenic, and available in powders. And finally, you could come here and you could try to directly inhibit the inflammation, the downstream consequence of the die off, and you can inhibit that with a lot of foods. So, having things like turmeric and making a little slurry out of, you know, coconut oil and turmeric and having a few spoons of that, having some ginger tea, having some green tea, you know, literally any herbal tea has some anti-inflammatory component to it, generally uh, licorice. It depends what you have in your cupboard, but usually I tell people just go dive into your cupboard and see what you've got. Um, most people in this day and age have turmeric, so that's a good place to start. But start inhibiting that inflammation and trying to do anti-inflammatory things, get enough rest, get enough sleep, do a little bit of meditation, maybe move your tummy around and massage a little bit. And between that, those four steps, you're well on your way to curtailing any sort of die-off reaction that you did have.